एस एल टी मोबिजाओ दी कनेक्शन एस एल टी मोबिजाओ दी कनेक्शन लेंगा तो कुमार वैटी करेगा ना लाओजी रुपये अल पन्ना टाडू कला मामे एन अब इतने कब बोम Tonight, no time for nonsense. Public Security Minister says UNHRC resolution will be rejected based on flawed Darusman facts. So, with all this very clear evidence, this Commissioner General stating that we have committed war crimes is such a nonsense. We must totally reject her report. The essence of Christianity. At Ash Wednesday service, the Cardinal calls for forgiveness towards attackers and a stand against international interference. Create animosity among us. There are some nations who would like to destroy that unity that always had. One-stop shop, all-encompassing national media centre launched to disseminate information on the country's development. We are able and we are courageous enough to take head on this challenge and that's a message that we need to let the world know. We invite all the other stakeholders who are interested in development to come and work with us. Facing the facts, the Attorney General calls for lawyer Hijaz Hezbollah to be produced in court to face charges under the PTA Act. All this and much more coming up on this Wednesday, the 17th of February 2021. अल्कोहल अडांगो हैंड सैनिटाइजर बावी तक कराने, लेडी रोग ऐतिहासिक विषय बीज वालों टा एरे ही वसा टांक कराने, हंदुन वादी में मिलन रुपयाल तुंसे पन हाई। From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana first at nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I am Shanela Fernando in your top stories for tonight. State Minister of Urban Development Dr. Nalika Bodeheva today detailed reasons behind the cancellation of the Japanese-funded Malabe Corridor of the Light Rail Transit Project. Speaking to First at Nine, Dr. Bodeheva says that the staggering 1.85 billion US dollar JICA loan for the line was too expensive for the government to enter into at this juncture. Furthermore. he added that the concept of the project remains unchanged and that discussions are underway to decide on the next steps of the project the much anticipated light rail transit project was conceptualized in a bid to boost the transportation capacity and improve the safety and comfort of public transportation within the colombo city however the government announced recently that it was to shelve the project due to the high costs of the project One proposed LRT lane that was to extend from Malabi to Colombo Fort, a distance of 15 kilometers, was said to be constructed with the financial and technical assistance from the Japan International Cooperation Agency through a long-term loan of a staggering 1.85 billion US dollars. In an exclusive interview with First at Nine, a State Minister of Urban Development, Dr. Nalika Godeheva, explained the government's rationale behind the cancellation of the Japanese-funded line. the lrt project was not just one line uh, there are four lines uh, which are in the plan a red line blue line green line and a purple line covering basically from ragama to kirlapana one line moratuwa to kalaniya kotta to hunupitiya and port city to malabe of these four the one uh, that involves port city to malabe is the one that was cancelled because uh, that was planned to be constructed uh, using a, a jica funded loan so the finance ministry has evaluated this project and they have taken a decision that this is too costly for the government to get involved at this stage the cost of this project is about uh, 2.4 billion dollars which is something like twice the cost of uh, hambantota to port construction just for 15 kilometers the cost per kilometer comes to about 155 million dollars so this is considered little too expensive for us to consider at this stage and that is why the finance ministry has taken this decision if you look at the uh, total project of the total project cost of 2.4 billion that has been estimated the loan component is only 1.85 
billion. Now, 600 million has to be incurred by the Sri Lankan government. So at this stage, given other financial requirements of the country, probably finance ministry would have thought that this is not prudent to incur this money at this stage for a project of this nature. Even though it is called a long-term loan, of course with the dollar escalation, in the long run you have to pay. So it is not a grant. He added that the other three lanes of the project, which were originally planned to be constructed under a public-private partnership basis, remain unchanged. The other three lanes, which were originally planned to be done under public-private partnership basis, were not cancelled. They are still in the pipeline. And if you look at the, the current estimated cost, they are much less than the purple lane cost. Roughly, it's about 60 million US dollars per kilometer. So we are now in the process of um, initiating a further discussion with the finance ministry to agree as to what we are going to do next. Because the concept is not cancelled. The issue is at which point we are going to start and how we are going to do that. That's a collective decision we have to take after consulting the finance ministry and the other ministries that are involved. Pay just 500,000 rupees to reserve your unit today. Mulberry Residence. Minister of Public Security Rear Admiral Dr. Sarat Virasekar says that the government plans to reject the UNHRC report and resolution that is based on the flawed Darusman report, which contains an obfuscation of facts. The minister added that it was nonsense for the UN Human Rights Commissioner to draft this report, despite six world renowned experts have already rubbished the allegations in the Paranagama report. The core group will forward a resolution, of course, right? And they are also having discussion with the government officials, foreign ministry. But what we say is, we don't believe in any resolution, right? Uh, let us live freely in this country, right? Uh, don't meddle with the internal affairs of the country. The Human Rights Commission General has no business to poke her finger or interfere into our internal affairs. That is not her mandate. And she is uh, exceeding her mandate, and it's very wrong, and her report based on the Darusman report, which is full of lapses and obfuscations and then wrong information. And at the Paranagama Commission, there were six world-reputed war crime experts which are attached to the Paranagama Commission. Sir Desmond de Silva, Sir Jeffrey Nice, <coughs> Professor Michael Crane, Professor Michael Newton, Major General John Holmes and Rodney Dixon. All these six experts have said we have never committed any war crimes. So, with all these uh, very clear evidence, this Commissioner General stating that we have committed programs is such a nonsense. It's, we must totally reject her report and that's what we are going to do in our next session. It will not be a success because I think most of the countries have requested the UNHRC to postpone this session because of this pandemic. As Catholics across the country begin the 40 days of Lenten sacrifice from today, Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit called for all Christians to stand against international forces that are all out to interfere in Sri Lanka's internal affairs and destroy its unity. Further, the Cardinal called for his flock to engage in the true practice of Christianity with actions instead of words, forgive their attackers and leave the outcome of the Easter attack investigations to a higher power. With today being celebrated as the first day of the Lenten season, Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, presided over the Ash Wednesday service at the shrine of St. Anthony's in Kochikade. <laughs> we have to pardon those who attack us. We have to walk the extra mile. We must turn the other cheek. This is the essence of Christianity. It's not hallelujah and praise the Lord and all those things. That is not Christianity. That is only words. The discipleship of Jesus Christ is more important than all the prayers. If we are not willing to make those choices in favor of him, it is not Christianity. It is tomfoolery. Two years ago, due to the attack 
on Easter Sunday, the country was grievously wounded by human egoism to create animosity among us. There are some nations who would like to destroy that unity that we already always had as Sinhalis, Tamils, Muslims, all of us. We were a unified country. When we received our independence, we worked for it together. Therefore, this country needs healing. We have to go beyond the East attack. Visheshenna Jathyantra Balavega Velata Meratta Angiligahanna Iradenne Pa Harunakarla Ape Prasna Apima Visadaga Mukhiyana Tavaratveta Idhiriyata Yamu. Meanwhile, the Attorney General today directed the Inspector General of Police to report facts about Attorney at Law Hijaz Hezbollah and produce him before courts. He is currently in custody for links to the Easter Sunday terror attacks. Hezbollah is to be produced before a magistrate's court on charges under the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights Act. Hejaz Hezbollah, an attorney at law, was arrested by the Criminal Investigation Department on the 14th of April last year on charges of having close ties to the terrorist group who perpetrated the series of attacks on Easter Sunday in 2019. Extending detention orders, the CID conducted several investigations into him under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. After studying the findings of the investigations carried out so far, Attorney General Dapula de Oliveira today directed Inspector General of Police C.D. Vikramaratna to report facts and produce his bulla before courts. According to the coordinating officer of the Attorney General, State Counsel Nishara Jayaratna, charges will be filed against Hezbollah under sections of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights Act. The Media Center for National Development was launched today in what will be the center point for all news and information relating to the country's development, targeting industry investors and all stakeholders. Minister Kehilia Rambukwella stated that the center has been recognized as the need of the hour where, given the current global situation, it is vital to spread the right message of Sri Lanka's resilience and courage in the face of current challenges. The center will be headed by Milinda Rajapaksha who was appointed as its director. When 2006 or 2005, His Excellency the President then, Mahindra Rajapaksa resumed duties, he knew that there were certain barriers with regard to the, the forefront. He knew that the oil prices were soaring up, that it, it was unbearable for developing countries, and the tsunami devastation. Nevertheless, we never discounted the development part of it against the terror that we had to meet. So we have some experience in this sphere. But today it's a different scenario altogether. Time that we embarked ourselves on the policy framework of the present government, we had no clue with regard to this pandemic that we are facing today. Hence, I think it is important that we deal with the world media, national and international, and to convey a very strong message that we are a nation that can deal with any situation that we dealt earlier with a more serious situation. Here, we are now faced with a pandemic. Nevertheless, we are able and we are courageous enough to take head on this challenge and come victorious. And that's a message that we need to very clearly let the world know. For that, we have set up this institution where we feel that we will be relating all our development work, which will benefit the citizen of this country and also attract the foreign investment that we are looking at, the tourism sector that we are looking at, the foreign employment with that we are looking at, the tea industry that we are looking at, the apparel industry that we are looking at. We need to pass this message on. And for that purpose, we need a institution that will gather every single information and disseminate to the rest of the world nationally and internationally. In the meantime, Director of the Media Center for National Development, Milinda Rajapaksha, issued an invitation to the media fraternity, academics and other development stakeholders to offer their inputs and participate in the current development discourse. Need of the comprehensive development communication dialogue has been on the table. Finally, Honorable Minister and the Cabinet decided to establish this particular institute which will be working full time towards linking people, policy makers, journalists, academia and all the other stakeholders into the development discourse of Sri Lanka. And this centre will be facilitating uh, all the interested parties to find more details, information, research and also uh, latest developments related to uh, not only what government is doing but also the, what private sector is doing, what civil organizations are doing and also what community is doing 
in terms of uh, development of the country, development of the village, development of the city, or the development of your own institute. We invite the media fraternity and all the other stakeholders who are interested in development of the country to come and work with us, share your thoughts and opinions with us, share your research and development with us, and take the unified message of the nation to the country, to the people, and to the world. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back in more news. The first waste to energy plant in Sri Lanka was officially declared open in Keravalapitiya today by Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. Constructed as part of efforts to resolve the long-standing waste management issue in the country, the power plant is set to generate 10 megawatts through the processing over 700 tons of garbage on a daily basis. Sri Lanka's first waste to energy plant was officially declared open by Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa in Keravalapitiya today. The project will recycle solid waste within the Colombo municipal area to generate 10 megawatts of power, converting 500 to 800 metric tons of municipal waste into electricity. The electricity generated from the plant will be added to the national grid. This is a 15 billion rupee project launched by the Western Power Company Private Limited, a subsidiary of the Aitken Spence Group. This project started somewhere around 2012 by the Aitken Spence Group. Due to various reasons, it got delayed and finally it was restarted in 2017. And today we launched the project. This 10 megawatt power plant will use about 500 to 800 metric tons of solid waste per day and since the entire Colombo municipality area is not generating that much of waste, the entire Colombo municipality council waste will be consumed by this plant. In addition to that, it can also consume some of the waste generated in the Gampa district also. In the long run, we are looking for several other technical solutions like this, not only waste to electricity but waste to other forms of energy. We will be introduced into the country and we believe eventually within the next two, two to three years time, we will have a complete solution for the waste management issue in the country. Deputy Director General of Public Health Services Dr. Hemant Tahirat says that steps will be taken to determine the source of the UK virus variant among the local community which has been found to have entered the country via foreign returnees. He added that it is vital that organizers of tourist arrivals take their responsibility of keeping tourists away from local residents seriously to avoid a further spread. In the meantime, Chief of National Operations Centre for Prevention of COVID-19, General Shavi Indra Silva confirmed that a total of 713 infections were detected in the island during the day. During the course of yesterday, a total of 756 COVID-19 infections were identified from 22 districts across the island. This includes 172 infections from Colombo, 168 from Gampaha, 73 from Kandy, 64 infections each from Kaluthara and Ratnapura and 32 from Kurunagala. The remaining 183 infections were detected from across 16 districts of the island. In another development, six more COVID-19 fatalities were reported yesterday. The deceased were residents of the Kaluthara, Kalambo, Munaragala, Gampaha, Gaul and Putlam districts. In the meantime, Deputy Director General of Public Health Services Dr. Hemant Tehirat says that necessary steps will be taken to determine how the UK variant of COVID-19 entered the local community. Available information indicates that majority of these cases have been reported from the quarantine centres and those who have come in from different parts of the world as brought this virus into the country but they have been detected in the quarantine centres and therefore we have a least concern concern related to the presence of such uh, variants in those places. But however, uh, there are a few cases reported around Navisavel and also in Vaunia and very recently some other places also. We need to investigate those places and then see how these people have got the disease and appropriate control measures will be taken in those places to mitigate any possible problems related to the presence of such new variants. Meanwhile, Dr. Hirat also urged local tourism authorities to take extra care to maintain the integrity of the biosafety bubbles maintained for tourist arrivals to prevent any risk to the general public.
We are maintaining a biosecurity bubble for the tourists who are undergoing the first 14 days of arrival because they are not confined to a quarantine place and they will be traveling in the biosecurity bubble. So therefore they are not entitled to mingle with the general population. It is very important for the organizers of these tours to make sure that biosecurity bubble is maintained and the tourists are not mingling with the general general public and also it is important for the tourist also to make sure that they are behaving in a manner that the biosecurity bubble is maintained. The public also has the responsibility to make sure that the biosecurity bubble is not breached and preventing a situation where tourism industry and safety of general public is in danger. Meanwhile, the total number of COVID-19 recoveries increased to 71,176 after 747 patients were discharged from hospitals today. Acting Cabinet Minister of Health Professor Channa Jayasumana revealed that Sri Lanka will receive 264,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines through the World Health Organization's COVAX facility by the end of February. In the meantime, the government vaccination drive continued today as well in several areas of the Western Province. The national vaccination program continued for another day today with a target of 57,000 inoculations in the Western Province. Accordingly, 27,018 people in the Colombo, 17,622 from the Gampa, and 11,710 from the Karutra districts were identified as eligible. Roge Petri me Avadanam Vedikande Hambagina Gihila Unta in Nat Labadi Matamai Ape Upakrame Vini Palio good Maluvel in the Pula Evagame many market take a low will in the pula varay matalasakatuna guantoti polaval bandragar niladarin norochole vidulubalagar is evakian and sansta evagame Rudire Kandu Karane at Lakana, Nidangata Vakodrogi in Pelina Rogi inte, why the Shishante, He the Shishante, Eva game of Parliament to Mantri Varunte, Ainata Labadi to Ikena, Promukata Anupilivele, Upper Handunagina Tino. Other Dine Apita Tahur Kirima Klebuna, Lokasauk Sangidhane, Coax Vadapilivele Atate, Enat Matra, Delaksha Hatatra Daha, Pebravari, Antimasati, Apita, Pradhane Katiata, Labino Akiena. Meanwhile, staff of the new manning market and the fish market in Paliagoda, as well as the Valisera Economic Center, received their jabs today. Further vaccinations also worked off in Kolonava, Gotatua, Morotua, Egoda Uyana and Hangwala within the Kalamba district. In the Kalutura district, the vaccination drive worked off in Agalavatta, Bandaragama, Matugama, Panadura, Horana, Beruala and Kalutura. Further priority groups were also vaccinated in the areas of Atanagala, Nigambo, Sidua, Mahara, Biagama, Watala, Minuangoda, Ragama, Jayada and Kalania in the Gampa district. In the meantime, parliamentarians, including Speaker Mahindayapa Abhivaradana, were also inoculated at the Army Hospital in Narahan Pitta during the day. <laughs> Meanwhile, Deputy Director General of Public Health Services, Dr. Hemanta Herat, says that it is imperative that the public constantly adheres to health and safety protocols, as vaccinations alone will not stop virus transmission completely. Vaccines give huge protection. However, the present evidence suggests that the transmissibility of the virus after vaccination is not yet fully established and it is theoretically, yes, it will be reduced, but to what extent is not well known. It is very important for all of us to maintain our health guidelines because this vaccination itself is not going to prevent the transmission to that extent. We'll return after the short commercial break. Don't go away. Welcome back in more news. The Minister of Education, Professor G.L. Pires, today assured his fullest cooperation to encourage the habit of reading and writing among the country's children while providing them alternative access points during such trying times. Speaking at an event held in Colombo today, the minister highlighted that the positive feature of the pandemic is the transformation it brought about, especially in education. The Asia Foundation today launched the Let's Read digital platform in Sri Lanka that aims to grant children access to millions of books through the National Digital Library of Sri Lanka. The initiative by the Asia Foundation seeks to nurture reading habits among children with limited access to reading material, enabling them to reach important developmental milestones. The launch ceremony took place under the auspices of Minister of Education, Professor G. L. Pires. With regard to the COVID-19, 
situation which has enveloped the whole of humanity, it is exceedingly difficult to discover any kind of redeeming or positive feature. But if one is pressed to identify such a feature of the COVID-19 pandemic, I would say that it has brought about a revolution in our thinking about education. And it has resulted in a significant attitudinal change to the structure and the methodology of education. We are all accustomed to the classroom and the techniques that go with the classroom. And when we found ourselves in the throes of an unprecedented crisis, parents, teachers, students began to think of pragmatic alternatives. If it is not possible to visit a library physically in order to take advantage of the resources of the library, then it behoves us to consider alternative avenues for accessing the resources of a digital library. Command of language is something that will stand us in good stead, whatever we decide to do with our lives. It is a facility, it is a skill that will ensure social mobility and success. This is why the government of Sri Lanka has embarked on a program to encourage our children to write. So this is why I particularly appreciate the several organizations who have come together in this call to embark on this exciting journey, which is a landmark in education in our country. Now here's an update on the Colombo Bose. The old share price index gained 7.43% to end at 7,588.34 points. However, the S&P SL20 index of more liquid stocks fell by 4.55 points to end at 3,027.66 points. Market turnover was 3.3 billion rupees where 81 stocks gained and 106 fell. In the meantime, the rupee closed at around 195 to 198 rupees to the US dollar today while bond yields were quoted wider. Now let's have a look at how the rupee traded against other major currencies during the day. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.